And, and I'm going to be preaching on this in just a few minutes about all of the devastation that took place in Turkey uh, from the earthquake. Well, Turkey and Syria uh, were the focal points of that terrible, terrible earthquake. And it wasn't a single shock. It was continuous for days. Uh, 40, over 47,000 people died. That, that, that's hard for us to fathom that number. But we're going to be taking up a special offering next Sunday to assist the people in Turkey. And uh, we're going through an organization that we trust is part of the Southern Baptist Ministry. And so we know that the funding is going to be correctly dispensed uh, and dispersed to where it needs to go. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. Next Sunday we'll be taking a special offering to try to assist a little bit. You say, what can we do? Not much, but we can do a little bit and we can pray. And I hope you've been praying for those people over there. <clears throat> Within a matter of hours... Whole families were gone. Can you imagine waking up saying, I used to have a wife, I used to have children, I used to have brothers, I used to have sisters. They're all gone. It, it, it's, it's a horror beyond what, anything we can imagine. We've experienced hurricanes, but it's nothing like this. About three weeks ago, before the earthquake hit, not one of those people thought they would die. They weren't expecting it. Nobody told them, hey, you better get ready. You're going to have an earthquake tomorrow or the day after. None of us are expecting to die the next day or two either, are we? But we don't know what's coming. Those terrible series of earthquakes shook Turkey and Syria. We've all seen the news with footage uh, of the buildings that are crumbled and crushed and falling down and people trapped inside. And some of them miraculously found days later underneath the rubble. It's amazing. The, they were some that were rescued after all that. Hundreds of thousands more people were injured in addition to the 47,000 that were killed. And millions of people are now homeless. No place to go. They lived in those buildings that are nothing but a pile of rubble. Millions, millions of people. I, I, I looked it up and I said, well, I think I remember seeing something in the news in the past about earthquakes in Turkey. And so I, I just I Googled it, okay? I cheated. I Googled it. I said, how many earthquakes have taken place in Turkey and Syria along, on that fault line in the last year? I couldn't believe my eyes when I read the number. These are counting all the minor tremors that don't make the news. They just kind of shake things a little bit. In the last 12 months, there have been 112,200 recorded. Wow. That ground never stopped shaking. How would you like to be living there? Oh, yeah, we just got another earthquake today. It's just amazing. And I said, well, Lord, if it's like that, in that location, I know there's earthquakes that take place other places around the world as you study and look at it, all the uh, plates and, and the shaking and, and everything else. I said, well, I've got to dig a little bit deeper. How many earthquakes were reported in the last 24 hours worldwide? Worldwide. 202. Earthquakes in the last 24 hours. Did they all make the news? No, they didn't. Some did. People died in some of them. Buildings were crushed in some of them. Of those 202, 59 of them had a magnitude of three or more. And many of these earthquakes have taken place in the United States. In Alaska, California, Oklahoma, Several other places, they were minor quakes, but nonetheless, the whole idea is that the earth is quaking. It's shaking. It's cracked. And Jesus said it would happen. And that's where we want to focus this morning. You see Matthew chapter 24 up there? Please turn to it if you have not already. We always encourage you to bring a Bible and take a look at it and read the scriptures for yourself because there's some key words in here we need to know. Jesus said it was going to be happening. And he said it was going to be 
the beginning of sorrows, meaning leading into the tribulation period, which is right before he comes again. Verse 3 of chapter 24 in Matthew says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? Well, he only answered the one question, a sign of his coming. Let's see what he says. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Don't worry about anybody else. Said, Listen to me. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of, here we go, wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Heavenly Father, oh, how we need you. How we need to know the truth of your word. Father, we sense we're in a time that it's not just interesting, it's critical that we know and we believe. Speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. The disciples said, what's going to be the signs of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus said, there's going to be wars. There's always been wars, he said, and rumors of wars. And the word, word translated rumor here can, can be reports of wars. You see, in your great-grandparents' days, they didn't get reports of wars unless it happened right down the road from them. But today, with all the technology we have, if somebody starts shooting at somebody else on the other side of the planet, we know about it. I mean, we, we can look it up if we don't find it already being sent to us by the news media. Yeah, we're hearing about wars and rumors of wars everywhere. And then he said, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. These are signs of the second coming of Christ. Understand God's plan is very simple. First, there's going to be the rapture of the church, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. And that's going to be followed by seven years of tribulation. It's a time when God pours out His wrath upon this God-hating, Christ-rejecting world. And then Jesus is coming back. And Jesus said, right before I come back, this is what's going on. Okay, you, you, got, you got the picture? Right before I come back, this is what's going to be happening. And He's going to rapture us out before anything else suddenly without any kind of warning. Let's take a look at the rapture. Don't lose your place here. We'll be coming back. Because we need to know this is what's next on God's calendar. First Thessalonians chapter 4, if you would. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 says, For the Lord Himself, not an angel, the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Brother David spoke this morning in prayer breakfast time and uh, he talked about how we need to be reminded Jesus not only was crucified, he not only died, he not only was buried in the tomb, he not only rose from the grave, but he ascended to heaven where he is right now. Amen. He's alive there in heaven right now. And so it says the day is coming when Jesus is going to descend from where he is at this moment in heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to come up out of the graves. They're going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, if it happens today, I hope that's us. I hope it's all of us. I'm sure it's one of us. I just hope it's all of us. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air Boy, that's going to be exciting. Yes. It's going to be quick, but it's going to be exciting. Amen. And it ain't temporary either, is it? Right. So shall we ever be with the Lord. He's coming for His own. He truly is. There, there's no doubt about it. It's, it's, it's as definite as His death, His burial, and His resurrection, and His ascension to heaven is His coming again for His own. The dead in Christ are those which are alive and remain. I don't know where I'm going to be when it happens, but I know where I'm going when it does. And I hope that's true for you. That's the very next event on God's calendar and it could happen at any moment. Because after that, 
He said, the world's not going to like what I do to it. I, they're going to pay the price. God's wrath will be absolutely poured out on this planet. You say, well, what's that going to be like? You don't have time to read it this morning, but if you want to find out what it's going to be like, look in the book of Revelation. Start reading in chapter 6 and read right on through chapter 18. And you'll say, I don't believe how all this stuff can happen. This is just too terrible. Yes, it is terrible. It's never happened before. No. It's unbelievable what God's wrath is like. But it's coming. And it's coming right after the rapture of the church, right before the second coming of Christ. The Bible describes that as a seven-year period of tribulation, of times, of trouble sometimes. And, and the first half of the seven years is not going to be so bad. It's going to be bad enough. But the second half is when virtually all of that stuff takes place. It gets so bad, the Bible says, if God doesn't intervene, no flesh will survive it. If He doesn't bring it to a stop, what's happening, He set it all in motion. But he does bring it to a stop with the Lord Jesus when he comes back. And he said, well, how do I know that this rapture thing is real? How do I know that as a Christian, I would go through the tribulation period? How do I know I'm not going to experience some of God's wrath? I knew you were going to ask. That's the reason I want you to look at chapter 1, verse 5. I'm in chapter 5, verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians. Here's the answer. God hath not appointed us to wrath. Who's the us? He's writing to Christian people. Yeah. He's, talking, he's writing to born again believers. If that's you, he's writing to you. If he's writing that, yeah. He has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only thing that's going to keep anybody from experiencing God's wrath. We talk about being saved from the fires of hell all the time, but look, this is coming. And His wrath on people on earth is going to be horrible, 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 but it's going to be nothing compared to the fires of hell. But we're not appointed to wrath. We, if we're saved, we are safe. Safe from the wrath of God. And we've got nothing to fear. Back to Matthew 24. I want us to look more closely at those words. First, the wars in verse 6. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars or reports of wars. The news media has kept our eyes focused on the war between Russia and Ukraine. They just had their one year anniversary. Was it yesterday or day before? Nobody thought Ukraine would last that long. I mean, Russia is huge. Ukraine is small. But there's some reason or other Ukraine's still there. How it fits into God's plan, I'm not sure. I'm not about to tell you because I don't know. I just know what I know, that they've been fighting for a year. And Mr. Putin decided he was going to destroy them and bring them back into being part of Russia, no matter whether they liked it or not. And he was going to do it in about a week. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, he missed on that one, didn't he? The battle is still raging. So again, I said, I've got to look at numbers. I, as I looked at the numbers regarding the earthquakes and all of that, I said, well, I know that's not the only war going on on the planet, although that's the only one you really hear about, right? I mean, our news media stays focused on where they want to focus, and if all you do is look at the mainstream news, you, you don't get all of it. And so here again, we get the joy of Googling it up. You know how many wars are going on, reported wars, right now on planet Earth? 107. 107 wars. They're fighting all over the planet. What did Jesus say? There's going to be wars and reports of wars. And of those 107, the United States of America is involved in 100 of them in some fashion or another. Either supplying somebody something or encouraging or espionage, whatever it is. We're involved in 100 wars right now. Our country is. You didn't get that on NBC, CBS, or Fox, or any of the rest of them, do you? You don't hear that. But we are. Wars and rumors of wars. That's what Jesus said. You're going to be getting news of wars. If you check, you can get the news of who's fighting who and why they're fighting and what they're fighting over. Many of them are religious wars. Most all of them have to do with power and money. All over the planet. Everybody's fighting. And then he said famines. We haven't experienced a famine in our country. 
But last July, the United Nations did a study on famines and they found that 43 countries are experiencing a famine to some degree or another. A famine is simply where the people are not getting enough to eat. People are literally starving to death in that country. Daily, deadly famines. Or they're on the verge of that. They're just barely surviving. According to that UN report, 41 million people are being affected by famine in the world today. That's a huge number. We, th we get pictures in our mind. Oh, that's just those little starving babies they show you in Africa, right? No, it's not. Oh, it is them, but it's not just them. Oh, yes, all over the African continent, there's a lot of famine going on. They haven't had a decent rainfall in some of those countries in a long, long time. We had a report from someone in my brotherhood meeting not long ago talking about that very thing and how he had seen these starving children and starving mamas that couldn't even breastfeed their babies. They were starving to death, too. This was horrible. Malnutrition. I think about the malnutrition. I think about this little boy in Jeff Davis Parish. It was on the news. Parents starved that baby to death. Literally starved the child to death. And there's no excuse for that other than just evil taking place. They say, oh, that's, that's what malnutrition looks like. He didn't grow up to be big and strong. No, he didn't. And he died from it. And, of course, they're in prison as they should be. I, I got a glimpse of this firsthand some many, many years ago. As a matter of fact, it was 1965. I was not in the ministry at that time. At that time, I was working for an x-ray company. Not x-rated, x-ray, okay, like in <laughs> hospital. Some of y'all weren't listening. You are now. And, and the company I was working for had donated a piece of x-ray equipment to a hospital in a little village in Guatemala called Weiwei Tenango. And I'd never been... Guatemala, but they said, Alan, get your toolbox, you're going to go down there and you're going to install that thing. It's okay. I, I knew how to wire it up, knew how to fix it. So they, they sent me down. Now, this, this, this was before Pat and I were married. That was been a while, huh? And, and so I went down there and I went with a, a group of people from Beaumont, Texas, and we went down there and got off the plane and I'm shortening the story up to where we got to the hospital and right across the street from the hospital is where the nuns, the married old nuns who were the ones that ran the hospital where they lived. And I call it a convent because I'm a Baptist. I figure you got a bunch of nuns staying someplace, it's a convent. I didn't know if that was or not, but that's what I called it. And I was probably the first Baptist boy to ever spend a night in a convent. <laughs> But we did, and that afternoon when I got off the plane, before I had unpacked my suitcase, they said, oh, come with us. I knew they had that look in their eye, like I, there was something special. Like they, I felt like these might be cannibals. They're going to eat me. I, I didn't know what it was, but they had this hunger look on their face, and they were so glad to see me come through the gate. I understand I was, what, 21 years old or so, healthy looking. And they said, we need you. I said, for What? We need your blood. Would you be willing to donate some blood? I, well, yeah, I guess so. Okay. They said, well, come here. We want to show you two people you're going to give it to. I said, two? Oh, yeah. So they took me in to one of the hospital rooms. There was an elderly man, again, skin and bones. And he opened his mouth and smiled at you, and his gums were as white as his teeth. Okay. The skin was flaking off of his arms. They said, that's malnutrition. That's what malnutrition will do, and that's, that's kind of shaped this man's in. Oh, wow, yeah, I'll give him. I'll give him a pint of blood if they keep him. This man's dying. I said, oh, no, no, he's not the only one. He's only going to get half of it. I said, just half? What's the other one look like? So they took me to another room, and there was a little girl. She was about five years old, and she was just like him. I said, take two pints. They said, no, we can't take two. We need to keep you alive. you got work to do. And so they divided it up between those two people. I don't know how long they lived. I know they were alive as long as I was there, which was several days, a week or so. And I said, this is what malnutrition looks like. This is what hunger and starvation looks like. You say, well, we never heard about that in Guatemala. Why in the world? 
Well, their problem was not that they didn't grow any food was, it? their problem was that their agriculture had never progressed and for the last 300 years all they'd ever done, grown was corn and they didn't know how to fertilize it. They, they didn't know what to do and so people were literally starving to death eating nothing but corn. And those examples of it, I'd love to tell you all the rest of the stories would be here the rest of the day. There was a lot happened on that trip that changed my heart and mind about a number of things. Famine, the Lord said. Famine, you say, well, it's in all those countries. That's way over there. It's not here. It doesn't affect us. Hang on just a second. The war in Ukraine has affected the world's food supply. How can that little country do that? They're a major producer and exporter of grains, different types of grains, wheat being one of those. And that war has slowed down the production. It has slowed down the exportation of it. So it's not being produced and it's not going out to other countries around the world. It has been, they have been dependent on the Ukraine for their food supplies. Not only that, Ukraine is a major exporter of fertilizer for the crops. There's been a shortage of fertilizer. Talk to the farmers. They've had a shortage of fertilizer in this last year. Was it all due to the war in Ukraine? No, but there's been a shortage of fertilizer, which means there's a shortage of production of crops, even in our own country. They don't produce as much wherever they are. If they're not getting the fertilizer they need to grow the crop, they need to produce the food that we eat. Have you noticed any rise in grocery prices? Do you remember any empty shelves at the grocery stores? Baby food? Bread, milk, anybody buy a dozen eggs lately? <laughs> Jesus said this was going to be happening. Oh, we don't have a famine going on our, in our country, but we're starting to get the ripple effects of what's happening worldwide. There is a shortage of food, and it's not going to get much better. Jesus said it's going to get a lot worse right before I come back. And then he said pestilences. I always thought that was an interesting word. I thought of a pest. I thought of a roach. <laughs> I thought of mice. That's not what this is talking about. Here, here's one word, COVID-19. Yeah. That's pestilence. You want to know what pestilence is? That's it. He said there's going to be pestilences. We've never known anything like COVID-19, have we? I mean, we can go on and on about how it started, where it came from, all the vaccines and all that. That's a whole other story for another day. But we've experienced Pestilence, a pandemic. When they first said COVID-19 is a pandemic, and I said, what's a pandemic? I heard an epidemic, but I didn't know what a pandemic was. Y'all know you have an ignorant preacher. He has to look up everything. <laughs> Pandemics. This isn't the first one, and it's not going to be the last one. Jesus said, pestilences, there's going to be more pandemics coming. Whether they're man-made or natural, the viruses keep mutating. It's going to get worse. I don't want to scare anybody, but that's what Jesus said. That's how you're going to know I'm about there. I'm about to come through the door. There's going to be wars and famines and pestilences and earthquakes. I gave you some of the numbers about the earthquakes a moment ago. But if you look over the history of the earthquakes in recent years and you find the number is increasing. Uh, on the average, a magnitude two and smaller earthquake, those little bitty ones that just kind of barely make a mark on the Richter scale, several hundred times a day worldwide, not unusual. According to that seismological facility of the advancement of geoscience, they said, now major earthquakes, that's those of seven or above, about once a month somewhere. And great earthquakes, the magnitude eight and higher, about one a year. And according to the eighth verse of that 24th chapter, Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. Many of the interpretations say what he's saying there is this is like birth pangs. A pregnant woman about to give birth. She knows when she's about to give birth because she's getting the pains. 
particularly if she's had a baby before, she really knows. And somebody says, have you had a contraction? She, yeah, it hurts. How long is it, how much time is there between contractions? Well, there's so much time. And then they check later on. Oh, she's having another contraction. Birth pains. How long has it been now? They're getting closer and closer together. You ladies, can y'all verify this? I never had a baby. Have, have y'all, isn't that how it is? They get closer and closer and closer until, baby. These are birth pains. So what we're seeing here is these events, along with a lot of other things, are happening and they're going to be happening in more frequency, greater frequency, greater frequency, and closer together until, boom, baby. But it won't be baby. <laughs> no, no. It's going to be Jesus. It's going to be Jesus, and he's not coming back as a baby. He's not coming back as a lamb. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back. But all this is going to precede his return. And we're getting to see some of it. Are we in the tribulation period yet? No, we're not. We're still here. The rapture hasn't happened. We're still here. But the pangs are starting. The earth is beginning to shake. The famines are taking place. The pestilences are here. All of these things that are going to be so prevalent and so controlling during the tribulation period, they're starting, folks. If you think Jesus is coming is a long ways off, you better study it. You better study it. So many of these things and a lot of others that we can read about in the scriptures let us know we are close to the beginning of the tribulation period. And these things are already happening. That seven year period before the return of Christ that begins at the rapture of the church. I said a minute ago that that's going to begin suddenly without warning. I've got scriptural reasons for telling you that. It's not a guess on my part. You still have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 24. Look down at verse 42. In verse 42, Jesus is still speaking. This is uninterrupted. He, he's continuously speaking here. He says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Pay attention. He says, Be on the lookout. You don't know when I'm going to come again. Keep reading. But know this, that the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Amen. In other words, you're sitting here this morning saying, when well, it can't happen today, it's going to be a time just like right now. Right. Be ye also ready. Could be today. It really could. Could it not? That may be a question for you, but the bigger question is not, is it going to be today? The big question is, if it is today, are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. I don't know if you're ready or not, but I'll tell you this, you need to be ready. Jesus said, get ready. Yes. <laughs> get ready. Because once that rapture takes place, it's too late to say, oh, wait, I want to go. <laughs> no, you can't do that. It's going to take place in a moment and twinkling of an eye and faster than that. And it's over. And those people that are left behind are going to be going through the tribulation period. You say people can't get saved then. Yeah, they can. But they're going to, a lot of them are going to become martyrs because the world and the government and the, it's all going to be against them. Everything. And there will be a church. <laughs> Apostate church that's going to hate the Christians. It's going to be terrible. Don't risk missing the rapture. You don't have to risk it. You can be ready. All you got to do is repent of your sins this morning and trust God's only Son as your Savior and Lord. The one that was crucified on the cross for you. The one who was buried. The one that did rise from the grave. The one that did ascend to heaven. The one who's coming again and saying, I can hear you right now. Well, you want me to save you? Ask. I'll do it. Call on the name of the Lord and you can be saved. I want to give you a chance to do that right now. So would you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your holy word. And Lord, the, the tragedies of thousands of people dying in an earthquake is horrible. But Father, sometimes it takes something like that to get our attention to where we say, you know, I've got to get ready. I can see what's coming. 
it's going to get a lot worse than that. There's going to be a lot more earthquakes than that one. The worst earthquakes. More people are going to die. Oh, God, I want to be gone. I don't want to be here when you pour out your wrath on this planet. Please, forgive my sins. Dear Jesus, please save me. Save me from the wrath of God. Save me from the fires of hell. Become my Savior. And dear Jesus, I give myself to you to be my Lord. Take control of my life from now on. I trust you. Amen.